write the last section in chapter 16, the end of fearless concurrency. Extensible concurrency with the sync and send traits. Mm. Let's get it. Interestingly, the Rust language has very few concurrency features. Almost every concurrency feature we've talked about so far in this chapter has been part of the standard library, not the language. Your options for handling concurrency are not limited to the language or the standard library. You can write your own concurrency features or use those written by others. However, two concurrency concepts are embedded in the language. The standard marker traits sync and send. All right. So what they're saying here uh, is that Rust has very few concurrency features. Almost all of them, everything that we've mentioned so far, has been in the standard library. And if you want, you can write your own or use concurrency features that are written by other people. But there are two concepts that are embedded in, I guess, all of our concurrency things that we've looked at so far. And those are the traits sync and send. Hmm. Allowing transference of ownership between threads with send. The send marker trait indicates that ownership of the type implementing send can be transferred between threads. Almost every Rust type is send, but there are some exceptions, including RC that cannot be send. Because if you clone the RC value and try to transfer ownership of the clone to another thread, both threads might update the reference count at the same time. For this reason, RC is implemented for use in single-threaded situations where you don't want to pay the thread-safe performance penalty. All right, so the takeaways from here is that most things in Rust implement the send trait, with the exception of RC, and they explain why. Uh, you can pass R a clone version of the RC into uh, uh, another thread, and then they both can try to update the ref counter at the same time. If we don't like that. So that is not thread safe and it does not implement send. Therefore, Rust type system and trait bounds ensure that you can never accidentally send an RC value across threads unsafely. When we tried to do so in listing 16-14, we got an error. The trait send is not implemented for RC. When we switched to arc, which is send, the code compiled. All right, so here they're noting the difference between arc and RC, which seemingly is that arc implements send. And they illustrated that in the last section where we wrote a bit of code, we use RCs, and we got an error, right? It didn't implement send. And we switched. Every place there was an RC, we switched that with arc, and the code compiled because arc does implement send. The APIs are seemingly identical. But arc implements send, you can use it in thread concurrently, safely, ways, all those words. <laughs> Any type composed entirely of send types is automatically marked as send as well. Almost all primitive types are send, aside from raw pointers, which we'll discuss in chapter 19. I see. So this is very interesting. Since almost everything in Rust implements a send type and is marked as send, right? If you create a structure with just these primitive types that have send, then your struct automatically has send and is automatically thread safe, at least for sending. Hmm, that's good to know. Allowing access from multiple threads with sync. All right. The sync marker trait indicates that it is safe for a type implementing sync to be referenced from multiple threads. In other words, any type T is sync if the pointer to T, a reference to T, is sent, meaning the reference can be sent safely to another thread. Similar to send, primitive types are sync, and types composed entirely of types that are sync are also sync. I see. Okay, so they have two really important things here, maybe three. One, sync. They noted that most primitive have this. And this is the ability to be able to reference things in multiple threads, right? But they defined it as any type T is sync if the reference to T is sent. So as long as the reference to T is has the send trait, then 
It has sync. Then T has sync. Okay. And then another thing they noted is that similar to send, primitive types are sync, and types composed entirely of types that are sync are also sync. So like we said earlier, if we had a we created a struct and we use types that all implement uh, send and that all are sync, then by default our struct that we just created is thread safe. Hmm, this is pretty amazing. The smart point of RC is also not sync for the same reasons that it's not sent. The rough cell type, which we talked about in chapter 15, and the family of related cell types are not sync. The implementation of borrow checking that rough cell does at runtime is not thread safe. The smart pointer mutux is sync and can be used to share access with multiple threads as you saw in the sharing a mutux between multiple threads section. Okay, so here they're telling us a few things that do not implement sync or that are not sync and at times not sent because they're kind of really intertwined. So RC is not sync for the same reasons not send. Mm, we kind of knew that. Ref cell is not sync and the cell types are not sync because the way they do the interior mutability is not thread safe. However, mutux is sync and mutux also does the interior mutability. So seemingly if you still want to do some of that in threads, you should probably use a mutux. Implementing send and sync manually is unsafe. Because types that are made up of send and sync traits are automatically also send and sync, we don't have to implement those traits manually. As marker traits, they don't even have any methods to implement. They're just useful for enforcing invariance related to concurrency. Out. Cool. Hmm. Hmm. Manually implementing these traits involves implementing unsafe Rust code. We'll talk about using unsafe Rust code in chapter 19. For now, the important information is that building new concurrent types not made up of send and sync parts require careful thought to uphold the safety guarantees. The Rustonomicon has more information about these guarantees and how to uphold them. Okay, okay, okay. This is the plot twist. So implementing send and sync manually is unsafe. Seemingly, they don't want us to do it. Uh, and we don't have to do it because everything that we build, as long as everything within the struct uses primitives that are both send and sync, then they by definition are send and sync. However, if you ever want to do this on your own and you have something in your struct that does not uphold the send and sync marker traits, you have to do it using unsafe Rust, which we haven't covered. That's in chapter 19. But more or less, the point that I think they're trying to get across is you should never do that. Don't, don't just don't do it. Summary. This isn't the last you'll see of concurrency in this book. The project in chapter 20 will use the concepts in this chapter in a more realistic situation than the smaller examples discussed here. As mentioned earlier, because very little of how Rust handles concurrency is part of the language, many concurrency solutions are implemented as crates. These evolve more quickly than the standard library, so be sure to search online for the current state-of-the-art crates to use in multi-threaded situations. Uh, so this one is important. So they're stating here, like they stated earlier, the standard library doesn't have much in the way of concurrency. They have things, the primitives that work, you can use them. However, if you want the most advanced, state-of-the-art, the, 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 the new shine on your packets, then you should probably go to crates.io and find which concurrency packages are out there and which ones you would like to use. Makes sense. The Rust standard library provides channels for message passing and smart pointer types, such as mutux and arc, that are safe to use in concurrent contexts. The type system and borrow check ensure that the code using these solutions won't end up with data races or invalid references. Once you get your code to compile, you can rest assured that it will happily run on multiple threads 
without the kind of hard to track down bugs common in other languages. Concurrent programming is no longer a concept to be afraid of. Go forth and make your programs concurrent, fearlessly. Ah, uh, here's the, the, the joke, the pun, because it's fearless concurrency of the chapter. But still. Next, we'll talk about idiomatic ways to model problems and structure solutions as your Rust program gets bigger. In addition, we'll discuss how Rust idioms relate to those you might have been familiar with from object-oriented programming. All right, so let's go back to here real quick. This is pretty much a summary, but the this is the, the big takeaway of this entire chapter. In Rust, as long as you're doing everything their way, you're not writing anything unsafe using the unsafe Rust code and keyword, all your code more or less should be concurrent. As long as it compiles, it should work, and you shouldn't have any of those well-known concurrency issues that you find in other languages. I'm looking forward to that life. I probably won't use it often because if I don't need to use it, then I probably shouldn't use it. But I can, and I'm I'm glad. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Rust. And then the next section is going over object-oriented programming in Rust, which is not an object-oriented language. But I guess they have some paradigms that coincide, and we already saw a few. We'll wait till the next chapter, though. Outside of that, if you like this video, uh, hit the like button, subscribe. I'm done with this video, so I'm going to say peace. See you next time.